It is official. The U.S. Express going to the WWE Hall of Fame class of 2024. And I am lucky enough to be joined by Barry Windham and Mike Rotunda, the U.S. Express. Guys, uh, congratulations. Thanks, Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Um, Mike, I'll start with you since since Barry, you you you've been in once before. So I'll I'll start with you, Mike. Um, you've had such an incredible career in professional wrestling, specifically in WWE, but even beyond that. Um, did you expect this honor? And and what does it mean to you? No, it was kind of out of the blue. Um, I wasn't expecting it. Um, it means a lot, you know. I mean. It, you're getting rewarded for a lifetime of work. So, you know, it, it's a nice honor um, to be, to have and, and have the respect of, uh, you know, the officials that elect to put you in there and hopefully of the, all the guys that I worked with that made me look good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Barry, this, this will be your second time. Uh, getting to have this experience. You had the four horsemen experience, but did you expect to get another phone call at some point to honor the rest of your work? No, no, it was a really big surprise. And, uh, you know, this one is special because I get to go in with my best friend and, you know, that just makes it all that much bigger. Can you guys, before we jump ahead and talk about some of the, the wrestling stuff and the moments, you guys, I mean, you're obviously physically together even as we're having this conversation. Um, your family, your friends, there's so much there. Where did the relationship uh, between you two begin? You want to go? Or you want yeah, to go? Well, basically, um, I was really new in the wrestling business. I started over in Germany. Uh, stayed there four months and worked. And then Johnny Weaver, a guy named Johnny Weaver from Crockett Promotions, um, got me booked. They called me and got me booked in, or maybe it was Dick Byer got me. He called someone and got me booked in uh, the in uh, Toronto at the Maple Leaf Gardens. So I went up there and I worked a match with Jesse Ventura, which lasted about a minute and a half. <laughs> <laughs> in <EDV. laughs> and afterwards Barry um, and his dad Black Jack Mulligan and Barry was Black Jack Mulligan Jr. at the time with the black hair and the mustache we met at the show and in Toronto they used to do like a ham and cheese party from, with beer and stuff where the guys could go after at a hotel so Barry and I hooked up and hit it off right away and I'm pretty sure we probably ended up drinking a couple of beers there and then going out on the town a little bit in Toronto. So we just hit it off uh, from the get go. We were younger guys and, you know, relatively I'm, I'm about two years older than Barry. So we're relatively the same age and hit it off. So we just hit it off there. And then I didn't see him for another year and a half. And finally the uh, dusty roads called we, he was working in Florida yeah, Champ. you had been in Germany then, right? Well, I went to Germany before, and then I went to the Carolinas for a year and a half. And then <laughs> Dusty called the Crockett's and said, I need a young baby face down here. So the Crockett's told me, you're going to Florida. So I said, okay, you know, and that sounded pretty good. And we got there, and Barry was there, and Barry was, you know, well-established. He'd already been working there probably three years at the time. And... um and Dusty ended up putting us as a tag team. And that was a good move on his part because we worked about 30-minute matches every night. Yeah. And Dusty would do the main event in the middle of the show and, and go about seven minutes. And we would close <laughs> the show up every night working 30 minutes for the tag team title. So, you know, and it was a great experience. And, and you know, that really developed our, our friendship, you know, being that was down there. just the Florida formula there. Right. <laughs> At, at that point, I mean, it must have been it, it must be crazy now looking back to think that at that point you never could have dreamed of that one day it would become your your family, your whole your whole life, your whole this this guy who you met having a couple of beers in Toronto would be the thing that led you to this whole this whole right. world. Well, yeah, and it, it just so happened that his my wife of 40 years coming up in October. Came to visit him in Florida. Wow, 40 years. 
years. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> and and we were married six months after that. So, you know, that's how everything got started. So, it, so, it was, so Barry, no second guessing. When did Mike come to you and say, "Hey, I'm thinking about proposing to your sister," or was it already a done deal? Yeah, he absolutely did, and he asked me if he should ask my dad, and he asked my old man before he went out with her. And he did which was right one. which was a wise move since Blackjack was like six eight, three hundred and thirty pounds. Well, and I was gonna in, say, oh, and oh, had a mean temper. Yeah, <laughs> of all the. I got to say, it worked out so beautifully, but of all the father-in-laws to have to approach to ask for a hand in marriage, Blackjack Mulligan, I mean, that's an intimidating one, Mike. Right, for sure. <laughs> but we were all working together, so we were all yeah. friends, too, yeah. so it was good. It was easy. So, Barry, what about your foray into the wrestling business? Was it always a foregone conclusion for you that you were going to follow in your dad's footsteps? No, I was out at West Texas State. I was rooming with Kelly Kaniski, and I was uh, on scholarship for football there. And uh, going into my second year, I think they had a, a referee sick or something. I started refereeing, and on the weekends, I would just travel and referee and haul the chairs, and then I'd start hauling the ring and then refereeing every match. And so, I mean, it just kind of took off, and – and it was during the off season of football, so it kind of just took over, and I didn't go back. Um, and at what point did it did it become clear, like, no, nah, this is for me too. This uh, this is going to be my calling as well. Uh, I would say it probably wasn't until. Uh, let's see, I left out there and came to Florida. I would say I was in Florida for about six months when I realized it really, you know, wanted to do it and then it, you know, it would be good. So I would say the middle of probably early 1980. Uh, I had match 79, I believe. Yeah. Did it come physically naturally for you? I mean, there is, there is a, that, that quality that exists and, you know, and of course we'd go on to see it, uh, in your families as well, as the generations go on, there is an ease. I've always noticed this, this sort of ease uh, in style of the multi generational superstars. Did you have that? Like, did it come to you naturally, just from being Blackjack's kid? Well, I mean, I'm sure at first, and I know I was. I was clunky. One of the first times I worked out with my old man, I picked him up for a slam, and I fell on him and dropped my elbow right in his eye socket. He had a huge black eye for a month after that sure you didn't to mean to do that yeah <laughs> it's like i got one in on it <laughs> but yeah i mean i was clunky and 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 hard to move around but i mean i figured it out after a while i spent a lot of time listening to dusty and eddie graham and you know all the guys i worked with i listened i was like a sponge and just tried to learn every match. He, I'm, I think he's being modest because he's like one of the smoothest guys I've ever seen in the ring. So, yeah, you you do ha you do have quite the reputation uh, for that, uh, Barry. Um, Mike, when did the call come from Connecticut uh, for you guys to try this thing with WWE? Well, we we worked. We went back up to Charlotte, and they were trying to go pretty much, you know, like nationwide, like uh, WWE was doing at the time. And it took off. We weren't making any money. And it just so happened that Blackjack had worked all those years in Charlotte for a guy named George Scott was the booker there. And WWE hired George Scott. So through Blackjack, we got – you know, uh, Blackjack told us, hey, these guys want you guys to come up there. And we'd had a good run, you know, in Florida for a yeah. good year, working seven days a week, twice each day on the weekend and putting in time and had our stuff down pretty, pretty good, you know. So uh, we got the call from George Scott and we ended up, I got married and about a week later started in WWE. So the only way I saw my wife was to bring her on the road, you know, and she wanted to go to California where she was born or, or New York or, you know, the bigger cities. So I'd bring her when we were on those and she'd come on the road with us for a week. And that was the only time because we, that year, the first year in 85, we worked 300 days 
Uh, and uh, and that was mostly double double shots on the weekends. They'd run two shows each weekend, you know. So we were putting in a lot of road time, and there was no rhyme or reason how stuff was booked either, because everything was selling out. It was hot. You might be in Texas one night, and then New York City the next night, and then San Diego the next night, then to um, somewhere in Canada the next. You know, it, it was just they. We'd go to TV every three weeks. They would hand you a stack of with a rubber band around it, your booking sheet and mm-hmm. your tickets. And the ticket stack was like this for the next three weeks. <laughs> you just got on those flights every day at six. And sometimes you drove, you know, but it was mostly flying early morning flights to get to the next show. Yeah. Who who would you guys say were the – is when you think of the U.S. Express time in WWE – is there one specific tag team that comes to mind as your most regular opponent? Oh yeah. Sheik and Volkov. <laughs> which was which was great because those guys were so over and so hated. I mean, it was easy, but it was also very hard because <laughs> There was a lot of like herding cats, <laughs> huge cats. <laughs> Barry would be on the apron screaming at Sheik or Volkov throughout the match. <laughs> like, it, it was, but it, it, the the fans were going crazy because they had so much heat. And then once we got established, you know, doing the the USA thing, the whole place was chanting USA. You know, so it was very exciting and live, but it was also pretty crazy at the same time and we had the same match every night for a year but it was different every night <laughs> <laughs> well, could, if, if, if you had to if you could if you were physically capable could you still work that match right now could you remember no. everything you have to do not with them that's for sure <laughs> it hurt then it would really hurt now we got um, there, there's a story can i tell a story yeah, please tell all the stories so we're we dropped the titles to them at WrestleMania. That's right. WrestleMania won. Yep. And back then they, they gave us like a week off, which was unheard of before you went back on the road. So the first show we worked back on the road was, uh, it was in Georgia. What, where do they do the masters tournament, the golf? Augusta. Augusta. So we're in Augusta. So we go there. It's the first match back after we did WrestleMania like a week or 10 days later. So the finish to the match was uh, Nikolai. I, I was making a comeback on Sheik and hit him with something. Nikolai is supposed to make three saves. And on the third, the third save, the ref call throws the match out disqualification. So, boom, I hit Sheik with something. Here comes Nikolai and Barry chases him off. Hit him with something else. Here comes Nikolai. Third one, Nikolai stands there on the apron and watches me pin sheet. <laughs> one, two, three. We hit, we won the titles. We're all looking at Nikki. We're all looking <laughs> at each other, looking at Nick. We get back. The Chief Jay Strongbow was the agent producer on the, the yeah. show. And he's going crazy yelling at the Sheik and Volkov. But back then there was no, you know, no uh cell phones, no nothing. So the next day, we give them the titles back, their champs again, and we go out like... <laughs> like it and never it happened. Broke. And it happened again. No. It happened the next day. The same thing. <laughs> and Sheik would come back, and he'd be cussing Nikolai out, calling him a dumb Russian, blah, 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 blah. And so two days in a row, finally the third day of the, the loop, they got it right. So <laughs> that that's what we're talking about. It could be... It was really easy, but it could be very difficult at the same time. That is that is amazing. Uh Barry, what was what was WrestleMania like? I mean, obviously we're coming up on 40 and you guys will get to be a big a big part of the weekend with the Hall of Fame celebration. That's obvious now it's a two day event. It's at a football stadium. There's endless other events. It's it's obviously just become I- insane. What did WrestleMania one feel like? What did it really feel like a huge deal to the boys at the time? Yeah, it did because I mean, we made a big deal out of it. Uh, it was, uh, it had a different, different atmosphere, you know, because all the celebrities and everybody there, uh, you know, we prepped for it for 
probably for about a month, you know, just with Sheik and Bo Coffey, you know, and just in with our matches. But, but I mean, other than that, as soon as our match is over, Mike and I were at the airport and on our way home because we hadn't been home in a month at that time. Right. So. We actually went looking. I was going to buy my wife a, a dog, yeah. a bulldog. And we went to this place in New York and looked at them. And for whatever reason, I don't remember, it was a long time ago. We didn't get one. So when I got home the, through the Briscoe brothers, um, they, Jack Briscoe's wife was partners with a guy that they bred uh, really nice Rottweilers. And I got my wife a Rottweiler puppy and her name was Mania. Oh, so, no way. And then yeah. we've had like full five or six Rottweilers over the years, but that Mania was our first. Um, That's amazing. Uh, Obviously when you guys, I mean, you you've you've both been at Manias before in the re in the modern era and been around and been backstage. How different is the vibe? I mean, you talked about the celebrities being there. You know, I work the I host the uh, the the kickoff shows for for uh, premium live events, and I you know Mania weeks come around. It's very different than if we're doing some random ple in St. Louis. There's not really anyone around. You get to WrestleMania. Caterings filled with celebrities and their entourages walking around. I mean, it's a, I just have to imagine it's such a far cry from what you guys experienced. How different was the backstage energy in the mid eighties versus today? Well, you know, when you're, when you're involved in wrestling in the show, your mind is on that as opposed to the surroundings, going on, you know, man. and if you sit back and watch it now, yeah, I mean, it's grown into, uh, unbelievable um, yeah just what goes on and all the stuff and i produced there for 13 years so it you you even saw that side of it when i was producing and it's a stressful show you know because you it's a high it's a high energy and you want to perform well whether you're producing or you're wrestling or what you know and i guess being as young as we were i think i was maybe 26 and very 24 we were just kind of zoned in and loose and we just kind of flew up there. We flew up there the same morning to WrestleMania, which we were supposed to be there already, but we hadn't been home in forever. So we jumped on a flight to New York. We did the show and we jumped on a flight and shot back to Florida. So, I mean, it, it was a whirlwind day, but it was, it was pretty cool. I mean, it was like, and nobody knew what to expect, I think, you know. And then once the pay-per-view numbers came in, I mean, it was a huge success, you know. And now you see what it's built in, you know, 40 years later. It's unbelievable. Yeah, there's so many moving parts to it that, you know, what we see is just a small bit, but the whole entire production yeah, is just huge. unreal. And, and, you know, to be able to grasp everything that goes on, I'm sure there can't be one person that runs all of it. But yeah. It's a, it's a lot of no, stuff. It's a it's, uh, huge undertaking, that's for sure. Well, and now, of, two days of it. So. Exactly. Um, it's even it's double the crazy. Speaking of backstage, were you guys backstage the day um, David Schultz slapped John Stossel? I'm sure we were, but, you know, I don't remember all went on. Was that, was that at WrestleMania? Yeah. No, yeah. It, it was at the garden. It was at the garden. I don't think it was, it wasn't at mania, but it was backstage at the, at a, at a garden show. I don't recall if we were there or not, because, you know, there was probably three, sometimes four towns running a night. So you didn't know, you know, looking back, um, I'm not sure if we were there or not. Do you remember, we, do you remember the conversation about, about it? Yeah, I was going to say, do you remember the conversation yeah. around yeah, it we after? Heard about it. Yeah, we, we were there. We were just in our dressing room down the hall, and it was just a little short interview, and it happened so quick that it was over before, you know, anything. And then it was just word of mouth through the dressing room. You know, and back then, the business was protected, you know. A lot more now. Well, I, I always sort of feel bad for I, – listen, I didn't know the man, but I always kind of feel bad for – for Dr. D because I kind of felt like he was doing what he thought and was the right thing to do in that moment. And then it, right. in the end, it kind of ruined him long-term, but I kind of felt like it wasn't that kind of the right thing to do as far as you guys were sort of trained at well, that point. That, yeah. That's at the time for sure. You know, you protected the yeah, you protect like the back before we got to New York and WWE, 
a lot of promoters, if heels and baby faces drove, rode up in, in to the town, you'd be fired for that because there was, you know, kayfabe in the business. That's yeah. right. That is the real meaning of kayfabe. It's just protecting the business. Yeah. That's what kayfabe means overall. And right. then, you know, it changed over the years, you know, and I, my understanding was because of the commissions, you they're treating it like a, a boxing match and here goes 25% of the gate out the door to them and they really don't do anything for you, you know? So, right. um, you know, WWE made the stance that it, it's an entertainment business and we know who's going to be when, um, in which we didn't always know because you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> so Exactly right. Um, Barry, when you, when you went back to WWE later, and the new blackjack things uh, happen. Um, what was that? What was that experience like? And what was your thought of a young um, Justin Hawk uh, back then? Your early impressions of of JBL. Well, events put us together so I could train Bradshaw. You know, just be around me, and I guess just more or less learn from watching me work or whatever. But you know, he 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 was really. He's really a great guy, and I guess he's got a bad rap for being a bully. But, but you know, he, he's really got a good heart, and he's a great guy. Brad, I, I love the guy. I I I love him. He's the first kind of uh, when I got to the company. He was always on all the shows with me, and would both bust my balls and and smarten me up. That that's kind of what he. I've always thought he's nothing but a but a gentleman in my time. Yeah. Um, and his work style, though, you know always to me reminded me of that old school hard nosed work style from your guys era. Right. Yeah. And I, I wonder how much of that he gained during that time working with you. Well, I mean, I'm sure that he did. Uh, I remember when I worked with him the first night, I think it was in uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. Uh, Vince sent us out there against each other in a, in a uh, pre-match, like a dark match. And we ended up going 30 minutes, which we were supposed to go five or six minutes. And Vince kept telling the ref, let him go longer, let him go longer. So I ran through all my repertoire with, with, with John in 30 minutes. But it was like, you know, I could, I could see it was there, but he was snug and everything was, you know, he was a little more than crisp. He was, he was really there. And I think that's just what Vince wanted me to do, was just kind of polish him and, Maybe show him how to work. Yeah, he's a, a big old boy. Yeah. You know? I mean, strong. So, yeah. yeah, in Japan, they'd say, please tag in a little blackjack. Don't <laughs> mean. And say that to him. <laughs> uh, Mike, for you, present company excluded, um, what was your favorite time in, in the business and, and who were your favorites to work with? I think um, doing IRS was my most successful run um and i was ready i started the at the varsity club to that was the first time i worked heel which i enjoyed the varsity club we had a lot of fun uh steiner and i and doc dr death and spivey was in there for a short time which kevin sullivan was our manager in the varsity club which made no sense but <laughs> it was like we were we had the devil coach you know but it was like, it was a different kind of gimmick because nobody, usually if you're an amateur, everybody tried to be the all-American guy and we were just the all-American assholes, you know, thought we were better than everybody. So I had a lot of fun with that. But um, being IRS, one of my favorite guys to work with of all time was Big Boss Man. He was, I just enjoyed, we had so much fun and, and, uh, <laughs> we were in the ring in St. Louis on an afternoon show. We had a double shot and they had the ice down because we were, were working where they did the hockey um, games. So there was condensation on the mats leading up to the ring. So big boss man, Earl Hebner, the referee and I are in the ring. I did my little promo. So we're waiting and boss man's music hits and here comes boss man. And it's about a, I don't know, probably a 25, 30 yard run. And he's 
hauling ass, boom, and, and he hits those mats with the condensation, and he, all of a sudden we're watching him come at the, this way, and he hits like a surfer. He's going, oh, and he's sliding <laughs> across the mats and bending his legs, trying to keep his balance, and his face goes, boom, right into the ring apron. And and he rolls <laughs> underneath, and it wasn't funny, but it was so funny. Earl and I are like almost pissing our pants trying not to laugh. <laughs> then we look down and Bossman goes, Oh, knocked the fucking shit out of myself. <laughs> <laughs> and Earl and I, Earl Hender and I are now we can't hold it back. We're laughing so hard. And you know, the people they saw what happened too. So just stuff like that happened. That he was one of my favorite guys to work with. Brad Armstrong, I'll tell you, was a, a really smooth guy to work with too. He was a he was a true baby face. He could make anybody cry, you know? So when I first turned heel, I got to work with him a bunch and that I enjoyed working with him. He was a great worker. Was the, uh, was the IRS gear uh, annoying to work in? No, I'll tell you what, it was really comfortable in the winter because we did a lot of buildings. That, it was hot, man, but I was always, I always slept. You just got used to it. It was something you, you got used to. And I, and I had, I would go on the road for two weeks and I had a bunch of these shirts and when we'd get them pressed and I just one at a time and then bring them back, take them to the laundry mat, but I'm not the, the cleaners the next time for the next go round. So yeah, you just got used to it. Did you, uh, I want to ask you briefly about the theme song. Obviously it's a big deal. You guys went born in the USA, uh, which was the smash at the time albeit an ironic patriotic song, but for your guys' case, it was just a straight-ahead patriotic song. Right. Then, then you end up getting the Derringer Real American song, which now may be the most, probably is the most iconic entrance song in, in the history of the business. Did you guys think right away, like, oh, shit, this, this Real American, could you tell that it was a thing? Well, yeah, we we did, but we were too stupid to hang on to it. <laughs> we ended up leaving. So, and and I'm sure you know Hogan using it made it even more iconic. So, but yeah, it was a cool song. But you but, could you have had the option? You didn't have the option to take it though, did you? No, well, actually, it was made. If you listen to the album, it was dedicated to two real Americans, from which were Barry and I. But like I said, we ended up leaving WWE being young and dumb. And, you know, it was, then it was given to Hogan. And he, like I said, made it more, even more iconic because, he, you know, he was over as, as good as anybody of all time there. So that's where all the music copywritings were coming in, too. That's yeah. why we couldn't use more in the USA anymore. And really, realistically, that's what people identified us to because we did use it for quite a while. Right. And when, that, when that music hit, you know, born in the USA, I mean, everybody got it. So it, it more to me, like sticks with me more than real American because of that. We, that's when our music hit, people knew here we come, you know, which half yeah. the time, at yeah, the time, we'd look up in the ring, and there'd be 20 people in, in the ring with Sheik and Volkov trying to fight them. <laughs> <laughs> we'd have to run to the ring and start throwing bodies out so we could have our match. So You mentioned you mentioned Chief J. Strongbow, and he gets mentioned a lot in so many of these stories because he was an agent for all those years in the glory days. Um, how important was he for you guys as a backstage figure? And, and how important was, I mean, then of course, Mike, you did it on the other end as well, uh, doing that yourself. How important were the road agents in, in those days? Yeah, they were. We had uh, Blackjack Lanza, Rene Goulet. Uh, George the Animal Steel uh, later on. Uh, Tony Gurria. Gurria. Um, Arnie you know Stolen. Yeah, Arnie Skolan was around a lot because he handled, like, the money and stuff. I mean, realistically, they didn't tell you how to work as much as the producers do now. Yeah. You hmm. know, uh, it was – it was, and it was a different job back then because you didn't do live TVs. When you're doing live TVs, you're talking to a production truck and they didn't do any of that stuff, you know, like Gorilla Monsoon would tell you, go to the ring. And that, that was, 
you'd go out and you nobody mapped out your matches for you and did stuff like that. So it was a little different job. They were just there to oversee and make sure, you know, who, who got there and everybody, everything went smoothly, which is still the job today, but uh, you're much more entailed in the, in the matches and stuff, especially at televisions, because you got to know to tell the, the director, the, you know, the keep the camera guys, well, here comes the next shot, that kind of thing, more of a live television uh, atmosphere and they didn't do any of that back then. You know, they, I don't even think they even sat in gorilla while, while their match was going on, you know, because it wasn't as finely, it, it wasn't as uh, in tuned to the whole system of live TV back then. So it's changed a lot. Yeah. I didn't even think about it from that perspective that at that, at that point, you know, it was a lot of grown men going out there to wrestle and the agents there to kind of just make sure everything runs smooth. Whereas yeah. these days it's a lot more, you have a lot of kids who are only in the business a few years who really need right. to have someone kind of help map it out. Uh, what was your, Mike, what was your last year as a producer in WWE? Um, I think 19, 2019 when COVID when COVID hit, they furloughed a bunch of people, and I was one of them. Then I came back for a short time after that, and then they let some uh, quite a few producers go, like myself and Arn Anderson and Dean Malenko and guys that had been there, um, which was fine by me because I was about ready to pull the plug myself. It was I'd, I'd had my hip operated on and replaced, so I was out for a couple months. And I told my wife, this is after a good almost 13 years of doing it. And I said, I don't, you know, after being home for a couple of months, I go, I don't know if I can go back to work. So it just kind of worked itself out like that. So it was okay to, with me. But yeah, I think it was 2019. How how much uh, involvement when when Bray came up to the, the big leagues, how much involvement did you have professionally? And how much personally would you just pull them aside and sort of give them insight? Well, yes and no. Um, I didn't have a, a, a few like Bray's matches I produced, but not a ton of them, um, which was okay with me um, because it, it's your kid, you know, and you're going to look at things differently. But I did produce some matches. Um, I did a lot of house shows with both my sons on there with Bo Taylor and, and, when I'm on there and Bray, you know, as, as the head agent or one of the two agents that was on the shows, I did a lot of house shows, live events, but not so much television wise, but I got, got to see uh, a good portion, you know, of them coming up and how well they did. So I, I felt like there was a lot more gas in the, in the Bo leave tank. I, I was a, I was a big Bo lever. I just thought there I, was, I thought it was one of the more unique sort of heel gimmicks I'd seen in a while. This sort of like almost ostentatiously positive thing. Like it was, it was very unique. Um, and, and both, and both your boys, just like I said earlier about asking Barry, they seem to have a smoothness to them in the way that they work. Did, did it appear that way to you too? Were they always messing around as kids oh, and yeah. trying to roll around? Yeah, they had they had the living room, and my daughter would film the matches, and they had we had some titles that we had, you know, at home, and yeah, they'd get dressed up and put on a show and film it, you know. So they they were around the business, and and at the time I didn't let them watch, supposedly, but I think they still were a lot of the stuff that WWE was doing because it was so risque with the, with the girls and the, you know, and uh, just the stuff they were doing and they were pretty young at the time, but I'm sure they, they saw a good portion of it when I wasn't watching. So, but yeah, they, they were always, you know, I mean, and that's a natural thing. You, your uncle, your dad, your grandfather, your friends that come over and they're all wrestlers and stuff, you know, and, you're just around the business, so I'm sure you get glimpses. I remember I was working for uh, WCW, and they used to film TVs in uh, Disney 
and at um, Universal, you know, down in Orlando. So I took the kids there sometimes, uh, Wyndham and Taylor, and they were in the ring with the Uso brothers, you know, in the, in the daytime, jumping off the ropes and having a practice match. So <laughs> when your dad's in it, you kind of grow up around it and you're exposed to it. So, and I do, I think, I think both ways, like with Bray Wyatt was one of the, the Wyatt family was one of my favorite gimmicks of all time. And both boys, I think they could have got a lot more mileage out of the Bray Wyatt, the Wyatts. And then also with Bo, Bo was the youngest NXT champion they've ever had, you know, mm -hmm. and he was probably 18, 19 years old. He, he caught the business quickly. <laughs> well, the rumor, and the rumors still pop up about uh, Bo is like a const constantly in the rumor <laughs> mill about what will, what will happen next with, with Bo. It doesn't seem like that story has been written yet. Right. Well, hopefully it'll, it'll get written shortly. So. And Barry, for you as their uncle from afar, watching from a, a distance, were you, how impressed were you with what Bray and Bo were able to do in, in WWE? Well, I mean, they're both so talented and it's just, now, now uh, Taylor Bo is you know going to get a chance, and we'll see what he can do. Yeah, I, I I've always I was like I said I was always a big fan, um, and you know I'd be remiss to not tell you you know I I was lucky enough I don't know Bo well I I was lucky enough to spend uh, some some nice moments with with Bray and he was uh, just an absolute gentleman. I just uh, a, a real treat a real treat of a human to get to be around. So a, a credit, a credit to you both um, guys. Congratulations. I'm excited to shake your hand in person and congratulate you in Philadelphia, but this has been a treat for me and my audience and uh, well-deserved congrats on the hall of fame. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Thanks we guys. Appreciate